Good morning, everyone. We'll give everybody two more minutes to get on the line. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Heart Feller Quality Exchange Call. This is a time where we give updates, share best practices, and have and answer any questions you may have about Get With the Guidelines Heart Failure. Today's presenter is Center Senior Director Cherie Boxberger. Cherie, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you. Hey, good morning, everyone. And Michelle, just confirmed that you can hear me? I can, loud and clear. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, as Michelle said, this is the a quarterly heart failure quality exchange. And just so you know, we have these also for today over the lunch hour. We'll have a quality exchange focused on stroke. Tomorrow morning at this time, we'll have um, a discussion related to code blue and resuscitation. Tomorrow over the lunch hour, the topic um, will be atrial fibrillation. And then Thursday morning at this time, there'll be a Get With the Guidelines Coronary Artery Disease Quality Exchange. So we are having these um, quarterly. And as these are meant to be interactive. Um, that can be either by coming off of mute and you just star six and jump in, or type your um, question, concern, thing you want us to address in the um, text, the questions section there on the WebEx. So I hope you'll consider doing this. So, so glad to have you here. Uh, this, it's always so nice to be on the phone with folks who have a passion for our heart failure patients. Um, I had a doctor tell us a couple months ago that when we were at a meeting that in a given hospital, they may have a couple of STEMIs during a week, but they're taking care of 50 to 100 heart failures. And so this is an important patient category and it's continuing to grow. So all of you who are part of Get With the Guidelines Heart Failure should have received an update on your data. Uh, in the last two weeks. That's what we call data days, where quarterly our directors that you work with are sending out updates and trying to just give you a hand by um, running your reports and giving you a little insight, because I know sometimes uh, you're entering data madly, but you're not getting those up. So we did have a, that you should have received that. If you have not received that information or you feel like it may have gone to the wrong person, um, we have an email that I'll be repeating kind of several times today but just use it, it's SWA for Southwest Affiliate, or just like Southwest Airlines, SWAQuality at heart.org. So if anything comes up, just pop an email to SWAQuality at heart.org, and we'll take care of it. Um, so if you have not received your day-to-day's report, if you've not gotten a recent update, please um, let us know. Sometimes the contact people don't get changed uh, in our system, so we want to make sure you're getting those. So anyway, today we'll be talking a little bit about the measures, as we always do. I want to look again at the post-discharge appointment. This is the, the most difficult appointment. And for those of you who might be considering it with the guidelines, that means that before a patient is discharged, you're going to have an appointment in their medical record, and that includes the location, the date, and the time. And as you can imagine, this is very difficult. So we'll talk about that. A few updates on our heart failure breakfast. Um, some important dates, and then we certainly want this to be interactive and be able to um, answer your questions. So let's just move ahead. Um, I don't know if this is showing. Okay. Um, I want to just reiterate, and of course, your, your day to day's report that you get looks kind of like this, except there's going to be a bar chart showing 
um, how you're doing, remembering that that top tier measures, the heart failure achievement measures, these are the ones that have to all be at 85% or above, and remember it's ACE, ARB, or ARNI, with the addition of the ARNI uh, within the guidelines in the last couple of years, that has become an emphasis and an alternative to your ACE, ARB. The three evidence-based beta blockers, very important. The data shows very clearly that mortality is decreased by the use of one of these three evidence beta, evidence based beta blockers, so not just any beta blocker. Certainly, and almost everyone achieves it at the highest level measuring the LV function. And then that bugaboo, post-discharge appointments for heart failure patients. We do have the second tier of quality measures. Um, I always want to point out, and I think we talked about it last quarter, that aldosterone antagonist is a class one recommendation. While it's in that second tier, I really do encourage you to talk to your champion about your percentage of performance on aldosterone antagonists and seeing if that is one that you can, you can move up. As I mentioned, ARNI, of course, while it's included in the heart failure achievement method, mes, um, measures, really there's an emphasis because of the increased um, improvement in, in uh, the patient's condition to see how well we're doing at getting some of those patients on ARNI. As always, wanting to have anticoagulation for our AFib and A-flutter, this is across several of our modules, as well as assessed uh, for CRT, CRP, um, an oldie but a goodie, former core measure, DVT prophylaxis. Um, getting those patients in within seven days or less, and I do make a distinction in those two measures. You have to have an appointment in your, in your chart, and then that appointment should be within seven days. So as you can see, you can make one and miss the other if, if uh, that is not done. Um, important to emphasize, and I'll talk about it every time, hydralazine nitrate, um, our only race-based um, guideline. Important that our black patients with heart failure be considered for hydralazine nitrate. Um, the studies are, are very clear in that. ICD counseling or ICD plates. Um, not only is this something that helps your patients, but it is an opportunity for you to grow that EP volume, those of you who who have that level of care, and certainly your vaccines. Um, and then don't forget that in target heart failure, the honor roll, you would have 50% on all of these measures. And that, that last one, referral to heart failure disease management, really taking that extra transitional care. So I don't know if there are any questions as we kind of talk. I like to start foundationally. If there's any questions about any of the specific measures, why, how, et cetera, um, come off mute, star six, or just type those in, and Michelle, interrupt me any time as you have things come in. All right, let's see if I can get my... <laughs> okay, I am locked. Any trick, Michelle? Let's see. I am stuck on this slide. I'm going to pause here and see if I can loosen up my slides. Aha, we got it. Okay. All right, I'm back. Just as a reminder, because when your docs are like, why are we doing this, which I doubt they will, but when you look at those measures, they certainly are not just for the purpose of you being recognized, getting a plaque, <laughs> um, any of those things. These measures are truly um, evidence-based. And I always want to put this in front of you, because when you see this and you see the relative risk reduction as it relates to mortality and readmission, the far right column, these are significant, significant numbers. So whether or not you're using Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure, you need to make sure that these guideline-directed therapies are being implemented at your facility. And so this is an important slide, and we'll send these slides out. This is one you should have in your in your uh, pocket ready when you're talking to your professionals. It's so weird, it does not want to change. Okay, here we go. Now let's talk about post-discharge appointment for heart failure. I wanted to give you an idea across the entire country, and this has a hospital name. This is not a hospital report. Um, I apologize on that. This is a all, all of the country report. I just used theirs to pull it. So this is the entire country, 60,000 or so heart failures, and how well they're doing on um, 
getting that post-discharge appointment in. You can see across the country, we're only at 80% average. And so for the entire country, we're making progress, but it's just slow and steady. So I wanted to talk a little bit, and as questions come up on this, because this is the one I think as we look at those coding instructions, we're not quite sure um, what can be in and what can be out. So remember, there are no exclusions from this, so all of our heart failure patients are in this bucket. An appointment with post-discharge provider is the first step to that smooth transition. So you've got to have an appointment with a physician, an advanced practice nurse, or a PA in a physician office or an ambulatory clinic or home health with an RN or APN. Or remember, telemedicine is also an option, but it would be you'd document it as home health. The only reasons you don't need explicit physician, APN, or PA documentation of why an appointment was made, so this is the one you don't have to have documentation, is patients a visitor from another country, state, or region outside of that provider's scope. The patient can refuse, and they're discharged to um, prison or law enforcement. Did I hear um, there might be a question, star six? Yeah, Sherry, it okay. was just a question okay. about the slide. Just a reminder, all the slides will be provided within one week of this call. Thank you. Also, reasons for not scheduling, you have to answer, those of you who abstract, you have to answer, was there a reason for not scheduling a post-discharge appointment within seven days? And this must be documented explicitly. And this is when you can answer yes. So it has to be documented specific like, there was a four-week wait at the county clinic, follow-up scheduled at this time. That would be an explicit reason for not scheduling a post-discharge appointment. So the majority of these where some of you are saying you cannot get it and it's for a legitimate reason, not just the office was closed, that isn't a good enough reason, um, you can answer yes. Now, you cannot make inferences. For example, you can't assume the appointment was scheduled for 14 days to discharge because one was not available within seven days. It has to be explicit. And if the document indicates, if the documentation indicates that a follow-up appointment was not scheduled because the patient is cognitively impaired, and that's comatose, uh, confused, short-term memory loss, and keep in mind this next sentence, and has no caregiver available to receive the details then you could answer yes. And there are some occasions where we have a patient who does not have that specific caregiver, um, and it could be yes. So um, I think there are some, some legitimate reasons that are keeping you, are, are, um, are falling, fall out, but if they have the appropriate documentation by your doctor, APN or PA, then you could answer those yes, and they would not be a fallout. What questions um, do you have as it relates to this? I know some of you, we talked after the last call, we're going back into the record after and putting the date and time in. Technically, per the coding instructions, um, that is, is not, um, shouldn't be a yes. Um, I know that it's a good way to get the patient the appointment, but in our coding instructions, that would continue to be a fallout. All right. Hey, Michelle, will you go ahead? I have to um, talk to somebody here. Will you uh, do the, uh, can you pull up your screen and show the date ahead? I'll be right back. Okay. I'm sorry, we're having technical issues. I'm sorry, Michelle, I'm back. And for those of you on the call, I apologize. Um, the only time my husband could schedule a day surgery was now, and of course, they're calling me from surgery. So anyway, we're good. Um, I'll go ahead and I apologize to the group. This isn't the, the best plan. Um, and of course, now my slides won't go forward. 
just a second. Michelle, were there any comments or any questions on this post-discharge? This just seems to be, as I looked over all of your results, um, so many of you, this is the, the tricky measure, and I'm kind of wondering what are, the, what, is, what are the roadblocks? I know one of you told me last time that you had physician offices that simply weren't allowing you to make the appointment before they were discharged. Uh, for some of you, I worked on, um, we worked on doing some reports so that you could see your discharges that didn't have appointments by their day of arrival. And um, unfortunately, I mean, it looks like the patients that are coming on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the patients who aren't getting the appointment. So that makes sense that they're being discharged on the weekend. Um, feel free to come off mute and talk to us about how you've dealt with this or ideas for how you're trying to deal with it, how you've talked with outside doctor's offices, however you've done it. And remember, star six to unmute your line. So quick question, according to your comment earlier, for those that are discharged on their weekend, you're saying you cannot or you should not go back into the chart to, to chart that follow-up appointment? Well, you can, it is not, um, it should be still a fallout. The, the instructions are pretty clear that they need to have it before discharge. And unfortunately, weekend discharges is not an exclusion. It, it doesn't, um, it, it still requires it for the guideline. Certainly in a working, in an operational sense, you want to do that. But if we want to go specifically from the coding instructions, it's not an exception. They're, they're expecting those appointments to be in there even if they're discharged on Sunday afternoon. So I know that's very difficult to do. And what I'm seeing is that people are having to work with their physician offices to get the appointments uh, before Friday into business. And I realized how, having done that at a, at a referral center in my previous life, how hard that is. Other comments? And, and, you know, we are open to, for some of you, you know, where these are happening, if we need to uh, send word up from your physician champions to our work group, our clinical work group. Certainly physicians in the field are always um, welcome to give their comments and, and concerns to our clinical work group that makes these guidelines. Other comments, uh, roadblocks that you run into, that kind of thing. All right, well, we are glad to work with you. Our directors would like to run through these items, um, be able to slice and dice the ones who aren't getting the appointments. It's interesting that you can kind of, because you're like, well, I have to go talk to all the doctors or all the places where I might send them. If we use your reporting correctly and we filter them, we are able to really find out who's the key group that's not able to get their appointment. When are they coming? when's their first day here, and maybe create some strategies just around those patients and try, instead of trying to like fix the problem for the whole. And I think that is one of the beauties of your Get With The Guidelines um, data. Michelle, anything else as uh, folks have typed in? No, but I do see that Carol raised her hand. Carol, did you have a question? Oh, great. Yes. Um, in, in our hospital, for the documentation of reasons the appointment wasn't made is by the social worker or the, the care manager, is that going, can we count that? Let me look real quick. Um, the coding instructions are specific where it can be documented, but it has to be documented by the the physician, the PA, or the APN, so they would have to review that. It can't be anyone else uh, who's making the documentation. And I'm checking it. I've got you paused because I'm looking at the coding instructions specifically so that I can tell you while we're on here because it tells where the locations are. And I would imagine the majority, I'm um, typed in, are the majority of your appointments being made by your um, uh, case management, uh, social work, et cetera? Can you, can you type in and give me some feedback on that? Hmm. 
Yeah, we'll have to look at that. Um, Carol, I want to make sure because it is um, specific that it needs to be physician. It does show some other locations, and if the physicians are reviewing in documents, you know, document that, but then it might count. So we might want to look at exactly how that process is going. Did anybody type in? Is that what everyone's doing, Michelle? Do you see anybody typing in and give us some feedback? We have a similar question about patients discharged to nursing homes or SNF centers, if they have yeah. to um, I believe in the nursing home, you put that they'll get the, you know that they, when their physicians can come, you don't have to have a time like home care, you have to have a date. And so, because they probably have their physicians there, you know, you know when the physicians are coming, you can find out from that facility when the physician will be there next and you don't have to have the date. Same as home care, you only have to have the date because you don't know what time. If the doctor's there going down the hall with 50 patients, you don't know the time. Same with home care, because they'll be on a certain date, but you don't know the time. So in those other settings, they can, they can have that. And certainly then the patients who are unable to accept that, um, you know, because they couldn't learn it, you could also have some issues related to um, mental status in that situation too. Any others? We have others. And I know staff okay. nurses also make the appointments, not the PA. Oh, on the or... staff nurses? Okay. Mm -hmm. So actually the floor nurse to, to say. I'm just interested in how many of you have a centralized mechanism to have these appointments made or if somebody on the, the unit social work case management, uh, unit clerk, et cetera, are working to reach out. Can you give us some sense that might help your colleagues? Esther has a case Pardon. management team who makes the appointment. Okay. Case management or heart failure clinic. Uh, even in the heart failure clinic would do it even before they're discharged? Do they go see them upstairs and then they would do it before discharge? Correct. Great. Others? Great. I really think, and this is such a, it, it, you know, I'm confounded as it relates to this measure, but it's the one that really requires um, some preparation. And I would encourage you to look at those Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and well, not Thursday. It's always like Tuesday, Wednesday patients. If they arrive on Tuesday, Wednesday, and you don't plan ahead, they'll end up being one of the weekend ones that you don't have an appointment for. Um, who was the one? One of you told me that you had physicians who, who the the office would not accept the appointment until they had discharged. Um, is that person on the phone? Can you tell me what that situation is and how you're how you're trying to address it? They may not be on. I'll try to find that out later. And as if some of you I see have a hundred percent on this, and. Um, I would love to know how you're doing it and how you changed it. Now, some of you, you have management of those physicians or you're seeing them in your own clinic, and so those appointments um, are, are easy for you to obtain. For those of you who don't have heart failure clinics, um, that can be, I know, much more difficult. All right, well, if you have other thoughts on this, this is one where I think if we work together, we can figure out strategies that, that can make this happen. Um, in, before we jump to this, any other questions as it relates to coding, things you're having trouble with, um, sampling, anything that um, you're having difficulty with? Well, we are always available. If you're not talking to your director of quality on a regular basis, please use her. Um, several of you have, we have new, uh, directors of quality in many of our territories, um, two of which have started, um, Emily Jones, who's covering Northern Colorado and Wyoming, um, Christy Esposito, who's covering North Texas, and then starting on Monday, we'll have Flannery O'Neill, who's covering Southern Colorado, New Mexico, and El Paso, and Alicia Webster, who's going to cover Oklahoma and our rural Texas, which is kind of our northern strip of Texas. So. Um, 
if you don't know who your director of quality is or you didn't get your day-to-days, SWAquality at heart.org because we really want to work with you on a regular basis to figure out um, some of these things uh, to bring uh, support to your department, kind of give you an extra, an extra little bit of an FTE we'd like to help. All right, well, I'm going to kind of move through Heart Failure Breakfast Collaboratives. These collaboratives are getting started across the six state affiliates. We've held these um, in 13 or 14 different locations, and some have already had their second meeting. If you, we would, whether or not you use Get With The Guidelines Heart Failure, we want you to be involved in our collaborative. Um, we also like your social workers, your dietitians, um, rehab professionals, anybody who um, really has a passion for our heart failure patient to join us. In these collaboratives, we're working together to identify some of the roadblocks to good heart failure care and hopefully even finding some funding to, to uh, do some projects. And so um, we want you to be involved. So if you have not seen that or are aware of it, will you just pop us an email to SWA Quality, tell us your hospital, and we will make sure you know where the nearest um, heart failure collaborative is. Our goal is that because our STEMI folks all know each other and our stroke folks all know each other, is to figure out how our heart failure teams can actually get to know each other as well. So, and be a resource for one another, because we see that in those other diagnostic groups, but feel like the heart failure folks sometimes are just stuck out there. <laughs> so um, please consider that. Um, an upcoming thing for those of you who are near to North Texas is that we are having a heart failure science update on November ooh, 29th. I think I have that date right. As I look at that, I'm double checking that. I just wrote it off the top of my head, and then it's like, maybe that isn't right. It is. Yes, I've got it, and that's the week after um, week after Thanksgiving. So if you want to know more about that, again, same thing, SWAquality at heart.org. Do any of my, if I have directors on the phone who want to talk about their heart failure collaborative and what your specific one is doing, um, this would be a good time. Anybody who's on the phone um, who wants to chime in and tell us what your group is working on, You guys have Lorenzo, to start. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Um, just to talk a little bit about the things, one of the issues that we found in like the Bryan College Station area, a lot of the heart failure patients utilize um, the community food bank, food pantries um, as a primary source of food. So what we're trying to do in that area is we're looking at um, maybe starting a food pantry that's specific to heart failure patients making sure that the um, food bank is able to offer lower sodium vegetables and canned food um, to people that are diagnosed with heart failure. Um, so we're in the process of um, meeting with several food banks who already have a program like this going, um, getting some best practices from them, and then seeing what we can implement in that market. Thanks, Royce, Larissa. And you can see these are the types of projects. Um, any of the other directors who happen to be on the phone or who have an update from theirs? Hey, Sheree, this is Allison. Yeah, Allison, uh, go ahead. So we're here in the Houston market, and for any of you that are uh, in this area um, and, you're, and you're interested in joining on this collaborative, we are, you know, we're a young group. We just got started, you know, a couple of quarters ago, so we're just barely getting the ball rolling. But we have um, a really great group of physicians and just an entire multidisciplinary team that have kind of come together from all over the Houston area. And we've kind of worked out that we're going to break off into sort of three different focus groups, uh, one aimed at community awareness, one aimed at professional education, and then one looking at clinical quality. So three focus groups that we'll have kind of a task force for each one so we can come up with a more targeted uh, project for those groups. Um, we've got some really great ideas coming out of the group as far as looking at what can we do for professional education, whether that's a conference or, or what we want to try and accomplish. Um, the next thing was coming up with some sort of resources handbook for the hospitals themselves. Um, and something as simple as just coming up with a contact list. That was something our group asked for. They said, you know, we get patients that bounce around from hospital to hospital, and it's just really difficult because we don't have anyone to contact at the previous hospital to find out what they did or what happened or if they know any more information that we could maybe try to, like, 
follow up with, and that's something that we can help with. If we need to work on getting you guys a contact list of all of the different heart failure coordinators or social workers or case managers or whatever the case is, whoever the primary contact for heart failure is at each hospital, we can help do that. So um, that's something we're working on out of this group. Again, something really simple, but hopefully will have a major impact. Um, and then last but not least, um, we did have some discussion about possibly partnering with the Houston Metro um, transportation system. Uh, there's an elaborate bus system that goes all over Houston, uh, as well as a train system, a light rail train system that uh, goes over the downtown and medical center areas. Uh, and working with them, we actually have a partnership with them existing, so it won't be too difficult to get in there, but to work with them on what we can actually do to focus in on heart failure and how can we work with our patients that need transportation to get to their appointments, um, possibly looking at utilizing the bus signs at the different bus stops for some sort of education purpose. Um, so lots of ideas coming out of this group, and I just think the sky's the limit. We've got a long way to go, but we're just really excited to get to work. So that's kind of what we're doing in Houston. Thanks, Allison. So that kind of gives you an idea. Oh, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. Hi. So this is Kristen. I cover Arkansas and the Texarkana area. And uh, we've met a couple of times. And just to add to what Allison and Marissa said, um, we are also inviting community medics to come to our next meeting. Um, for those patients that can't come to follow-up appointments or don't qualify for home health, um, some do some of the patients will allow the community medics to come in and, and assess them. So we're connecting with them. Um, also uh, planning to work on a health fair kit, something similar to um, public education for stroke and STEMI. We want to do that for, for health, um, heart failure as well. And also getting um, palliative care to the table. Great, Kristen. And Kristen's group has decided they really would like to work as a state. So they're trying to create a collaborative and figure out how they can work um, kind of as one collaborative with different arms um, across the state. So if you haven't been involved in one of these, SWA Quality, and we'll make sure we get you going because they are um, fun and interesting groups as well as um, expanding the number of colleagues you have across the country. Um, some important dates to note, uh, November 29th, the quarter three data should be due, um, and that should say abstracted, not extracted, they all say abstracted. Um, so they should be abstracted, forget what the guidelines. Um, there'll be Hi. another call like this, January 29th. Hi, Sheree. The Q4 uh, data, yep, go ahead. Hi, we still have one screen up. Um, did you move to the next screen? I'm so glad. I'm looking at them. I don't know what your problem is. Um, <laughs> so uh, November 29th, Q3. Um, and just so you know, these are supposed to be informal like we're in the room. So don't hesitate to yell out to me. Um, you've got March 1st with Q4 day to do. March 29th and, um, is the final day to change any 2018 data. So we'd really like your data to be done on March 1st so we can do any tweaking. So be thinking about this. March 5th and 6th with this Q Core, and this is a new venue for heart failure recognition that's going to be in DC with an actual Get With the Guidelines um, track. Um, again, if you want more information, SWA Quality, we will be sending it out to our whole group. In May, the recognition awards are approved and distributed. In July, listed in US News and World Report. And speaking of which, um, we do have the inserts for US News and Report reprints of that. So if you are gold or silver and want to see what the reprint looks like, talk to your director or SWA quality, and we'll make sure you get that. Um, obviously, May 29th, Q1, and you kind of get the sense um, every three months there for your data. So what we're really aiming for, if you're a little behind in your data, is 2018 data being done by the end of February. Any comments or questions on that? All right, and then just a little heart failure in the news. I'll try to do this each time, and when I send out these, you'll have the link to these articles. Um, interesting, we put a, a statement, AHA put out a statement earlier in the year about heart failure patients um, as a result um, many years later after chemotherapy. And so certainly because we've had early detection and treatment of breast cancer, um, it definitely has helped reduce the death rates, but those treatments can result in heart damage. So we are starting to see some heart failure there. And as I have told others, you know, heart failure is a growing category because of our advancements in healthcare. As we've done better at saving STEMIs, as we've done better at saving strokes, 
as we do better at saving breast cancer patients, there is the instance in some, uh, because that heart muscle can be damaged. And uh, so later on, 20, 30 years, we may see some heart failure. Certainly a number of articles coming about in increasing exercise can prevent heart failure. And Lord knows we wanna not be in the heart failure club if we can avoid it. Um, here's another article, walking exercise, both linked to lower heart failure in older women. And then one from May 29th that there, that there is some thought that too much meat or dairy is linked to the heart failure risk. So when we send these out, you will just click on these links and you'll be able to have that. So um, I am gonna have to come off. Um, that's the end of our content. Uh, Michelle, will you take it from there, please? Will do. Just a reminder, all these slides will be sent one week from today. Do we have any other questions we wanna go over real fast? I'm actually gonna go back to a couple. So Hannah Lee asked if for patients charged to a nursing home or SNS, if they will require a scheduled appointment for discharge, they do not. So that is one of the um, exclusions criteria is their discharge status. So no, uh, Hannah Lee, those will not be required to have a discharge appointment. And also, I just want to add on that RNs are able to document this as well. So it's not only PAs, APNs, uh, PAs, but also RNs. And I had one more question. Uh, Nora asked if a patient refuses for a follow-up appointment, if that's an eligible exclusion, it, also con it is also considered an exclusion criteria. You just have to be documented within the, uh, within the PM team, just so we know those are excluded patients. Do we have any other questions before we hop off? Well, just a reminder, these calls are for you. So if you have anything you want us to cover for next time around, go ahead and feel free to send something over to your director and we'll add it on to the next quality exchange call. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you so much for joining us and send any questions or follow-up comments to your director. Have a wonderful day.